Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fort Detrick Business Development Office webinar series. Today's webinar is Teaming Essentials, What Primes Really Want. I am Gloria Larkin, President of TargetGov. We're very happy to be presenting this webinar in conjunction with the Fort Detrick Business Development Office. We're very, also very glad that Judy Bratt, CEO of Summit Insight, is here today to share with us her expertise in the whole wonderful world of teaming on government contracts. The Fort Detrick Business Development Office is represented today by our very capable Steve Lamberson, the Business Development Specialist. Hi, Steve. Glad you're here. Hi, Gloria. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank Judy Brandt for making this webinar on Teaming Essentials with Prime Contractors possible today. So thank you for joining us, Judy. And, and also, after Judy's presentation, I'd like to say a little bit about the feature benefits of the Fort Detrick Business Development Office. That would be perfect. We'll look forward to that. And while you see the slide in front of you, at the bottom of it and every slide that we have, you'll see an email address. Because of the number of attendees today, we're handling questions through this email address, and we're recording the session so that if you're listening to it as a recording, you can still ask your questions by sending them in to ask, A-S-K, at fdbdo.com. No matter when you're attending this session, live or as a recording, Steve Lamberson and the capable folks at the Fort Detrick Business Development Office and Judy Bratt will be there to answer your questions. Know that you have an expert staff ready to help you be as successful as you can be. And I am Gloria Larkin, President of Target Gov. We're very happy to be able to present this webinar series with Fort Detrick Business Development Office. As we get started today, though, let me tell you a little bit about our subject matter expert, Judy Brett. She is the CEO of Summit Insight and the author of the new book, Government Contracts Made Easier. She's one of America's top champions for savvy business owners exploring government contracts. For over 23 years, she has counseled more than 6,000 clients who credit her advice for winning more than $300 million in government business. Judy's a strategic advisor for government contracts, bringing her clients, readers, and audiences no-nonsense insight on winning government business. She just helped one client close a contract worth nearly $500,000, and another became a vendor on the Navy's prestigious Seaport E contract. Judy, we're very happy to have you today. I'd like to turn this over to you. Lori, thank you. And Steve, I really appreciate the invitation to serve the clientele of the Fort Dietrich Business Development Office. Teaming. It's one of the most dynamic, exciting aspects of federal contracting. Many of us will have to team or have teamed to win our first government contracts, and some of us will team consistently and always in the market and will never be primed. Both of those represent great outcomes. In some ways, there's not necessarily a huge rush to be a prime contractor. Be careful what you wish for. There's a fine living to be made and a profitable one sometimes with less paperwork, too, if you are a subcontractor. And so we definitely want to explore the different aspects of teaming, what kind of things suggest that the timing might be right to team, and what kinds of things to look out for to make it a good experience for you and your partners, whether you're a prime, a sub, or a member of a team. So let's get to it. Why would you want to team? Well, first of all, there's the option of having more flexibility with the size standards that can affect who has access to that contract if the opportunity is set aside or reserved for small business. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But leveraging and staying on the right side of the special rules that the Small Business Administration has 
for certain kinds of partnerships can give you an advantage. You can increase your competitiveness. If you can meet some but not all of the requirements of the contract and a partner can meet the others, you can win a piece of business with someone else that you couldn't win alone. Government and the primes both like the way that teaming can reduce risks and costs. If you as a contractor don't have the full skill set, but you as a partner do, that can lower the risk. Similarly, if you're not going out and hiring people who aren't really skilled in what it is that they need, but you're bringing on a partner who has good past performance, that can also bring the cost down. I love this next point. You can gain past performance. That's one of the most critical elements to winning more government business because government buyers are some of the most risk averse on earth. They want to know that you've solved their problem for someone who looks just like them yesterday afternoon. And so in order to do that, they all want to know, show me where you've solved a problem like mine before. Being a teaming partner can be a great way to have experience, gain experience in an agency where you haven't done business before, provided you can take some other steps that can show that you've got the strength to be on the team in the first place, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. In some instances, a partner can help you with certifications, can help you access bonding or financing on some kinds of construction contracts, and in some instances, a company may have a certification or be eligible for a set-aside that your company is not. All of those things can give you more access to opportunities. On a contract worth more than $650,000, a prime contractor must have a small business subcontracting plan. And so teaming is an important way that those large contractors meet their small business subcontracting goals. And I'll throw this out here as well. If a contract is for state and local government, a lot of the time the buyers really want to see that you've got somebody in the community. You've got a partner that's right there. So if you're in Maryland and you're trying to win a contract in Pennsylvania, having a Pennsylvania partner can make a huge difference. So those are just some of the good reasons to team. I love this question. I had polled some large prime contractors at a contracting conference, and I asked them two questions. I said, when you are trying to unseat the incumbent, how long ahead of the contract are you putting together your teaming partners? And the answer was about 6 to 12 months. I said, all right. Now, when you're the incumbent, you're already in the account, you're performing the work, you know the buyers, you know the agency, how far in advance of the recompete are you putting together your team? You might think that the lead time is less. In fact, it's more. Time after time, the large prime said 12 to 18 months before that recompete starts, before the RFP drops, those partners are putting together their teams. So I won't even ask if one of the ways that you look for teaming opportunities is to see who's been awarded a big contract and then say, can we get on the team? I'm going to presume that you've stopped doing that and you're looking for better answers. Looking for opportunities that are coming up 6, 12, 18 months ahead of the recompete or of the opportunity going up for competition is when you want to be looking for teaming partners. Look at it this way. The Olympic bobsleigh team that triumphs is not just a couple of guys who happen to be wandering around with a graphite sleigh strapped to the top of the Volvo going past the start and finish line at Whistler on the day of the competition. They audition partners. They trained. They picked the best partners. They practiced. They looked at competitors. They, they shot video. They tried again and again and again. And so by the time the competition began and that start gate opened, 90% of who was going to win, which team was going to succeed, was already pretty clear. The foundation was laid. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business Olympics. So often, companies ask me, what is it that I have to do to get the primes to call me back? I'd like to borrow a line from our friend Jerry Maguire. Show me the money. You wouldn't think that big companies like BAE or Northrop Grumman or Lockheed Martin care about what you, a small company, are bringing to them besides your expertise and your good people. 
you want to get their attention, the number one way to do that is bring the business with you. That's a big surprise for a lot of people. I was talking to a client on the phone just today, and I thought we'd been through this a lot of times, and he was approaching prime, he was approaching prime contractors, and he was showing me copies of the email that he had sent. And sure enough, more or less what he was writing was, hi, here's our company, here's what we do, here's our capability statement. If you need anything like this, please call us. Does that sound like the kind of emails you've sent out? If it does, you probably have the experience that my, my friend Dave had, not a lot of answers. Let's try that again. If instead of, hi, here's our stuff, call us if you want something, imagine what it sounds like if you say, hi, we've just been over to see the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, and they say they're going to die if they don't have what we've got. Want to talk? There's an opportunity coming up. We can help you win better with us than without us. That's seductive. That's the kind of thing that gets someone's attention. If you take certain steps first. So we're going to go through exactly what those are. Here's the kinds of things that partners are really looking for. First of all, what business are you bringing them? Have you identified a specific opportunity, either a project that that prime contractor is already involved in and they're likely to be recompeting for, or a piece of business in an agency or a project that they're not involved in but you think they're a good candidate to win. And you can do a part of that work, and they're very likely to be front and center doing more of it. So identifying a specific opportunity is important because teaming is opportunistic. Teaming is all about the single opportunity, not about, hi, oh boy, I'm on BAE Systems team, I'm all set. Mm -mm. Doesn't happen that way. Now, here's another thing that surprises folks. The primes want to know, who do you know? What relationships do you have in that agency? Because you, you would think they've got hundreds of people, those primes, in the agencies, but they don't know everybody. And one of the things that you can bring with you are those relationships with the end users, with subject matter experts, with influencers right in that agency who like you, who trust you. And that is going to give your partner an advantage. Next, they look at your core capabilities and how you describe what you do as different, as unique, compared to other small partners that they might consider teaming with. With core capabilities, the thing to remember is nobody does everything well. When you're thinking about your core capabilities, you want to have a list of maybe four bullet points. It doesn't have to be long, but what are the core things that you're really, really good at? Now, here's a tip. You might actually shuffle that list. You might change it a little bit from one prime to the next or from one project to the next. But remember, you want to be top of mind for a very specific thing. So focus and make it a short list because prime after prime will tell you nobody does everything well. The thing you don't want to do is to say we do everything because they know you don't. Past performance and reputation. This is really interesting. Very often folks who are thinking about time, uh, teaming for the first time will say, well, I don't have any past performance. Look closely. You probably own an established company. That means you have clients who have worked with you before, and that means that you've got experience in already doing the kind of work, solving the kinds of problems that these primes and their related government agencies' clients already have. And so you might, ideally, you've already done work in, let's say it's the uh, Protestant River Naval Air Station with the Navy. Maybe you have already done other work with the Navy. Maybe you've done work for the Department of Homeland Security. Maybe you've done work for a civilian, another civilian agency. Maybe your past performance is uh, in the commercial sector, but you've solved a problem, let's say it's a financial management problem for a large insurance or bank organization, but the government agency that you're working with has a similar kind of financial management problem. What matters is past performance at solving the problem that you propose to solve for them. People also ask, gee, what about past performance uh, if I've only been a subcontractor? That counts too. And remember too, you, 
if you were on a, involved in a project that didn't go so well, don't back away from that past performance either because remember if what you did in a situation that didn't go so well was you saved the project, you worked past the 11th hour, you made it, you're the reason why the project got done despite difficulties, that's a shining moment and it could be a really good example of how you walk your talk and how you stand out. Of course, price counts. Government budgets are being squeezed and what the prime quotes the agency is not the money that you're going to get. They're going to take a piece of the action. So you're going to need to know exactly what your margins are and how deep you can still discount your price and still make that a profitable arrangement. So you've really got to know your financial ratios and how strong your pricing can be. Don't expect to hide your financial information, your corporate financial information under the covers. You're going to have to reveal that. And if you're uncomfortable with opening your books to a prime contractor or a partner, then this isn't a game you want to play. Sometimes the differentiator can be very simple. Location, location, location. The example I cited earlier, if you're trying to do business at the Pax River Naval Air Station, one of your advantages could be that you're you happen to be located 500 yards outside the chain link fence. So look for those differences that may be simple, but will make a difference in how comfortable somebody is with you and the, how they want to spend time with you. Are you dependable, responsible, a team player? All of those things are high on the list of things that primes look for. But remember to avoid the kiss of death. Do not say the words, we do everything. Sure, we're really good at anything. You just tell us and we're going to go and do it. Not. Pick one or two things that you really want them to have, think of you as top of mind. And that's where you want to focus when you're introducing yourself. I'm going to give you three ways to completely rock your capability briefing when you're meeting with one of these prime contractors for the first time. Because remember, you're almost never meeting with ultimately the person that you want to be making contact with. Your first meeting is very likely to be with a small business liaison officer with one of these large primes. And so you want to be able to tell them just the things they want to know to help them move the relationship forward. And remember this, your average meeting is usually about 30 minutes if you're lucky. Then there's the great exceptions. If you get involved in one of the vendor outreach sessions at the Department of Homeland Security, you have 15 minutes. And if you're thinking it's going to, well, goodness, 15 minutes isn't a lot of time to make your company presentation, think again. Because if you've talked for all 15 of those 15 minutes or 29 of those 30 minutes, what have you learned? Nothing. Zero. Zip. Zilch. Nada. Nothing. What you want to be able to do is really have about a, a 30 to 70 talk to listen ratio. You want to be able to be pitching or making that presentation taking up no more than one-third of the time of your meeting so that you're then opening up the discussion with the person that you're meeting with to deepen the relationship, find out things you haven't already researched, and confirm the research that you've already done and move toward achieving your objectives for that meeting. So I'm going to ask you to think about that presentation you have about your corporate capabilities. If it's in PowerPoint, and often it is, how long is it? I'm going to give you a formula to knock it back to six simple slides you can present in 600 seconds. 600 seconds. How long is 600 seconds? Ten minutes. Can you do it? Can you rehearse it? You're going to have to. And here's how. So I've done this on a six-box slide here, so you can see what all the components are at a glance. Remember, too, that this is high-level information. You're not going to clutter these slides up with every single piece of text in six-point type and make it unreadable. You're going to have the detail for all of these slides on your capability statement, and that's a great thing to go back and ask the folks at Target Gov and the Federal, Frederick Business Development Office about, because I know Gloria has a marvelous presentation that goes into great depth about effective capability presentations and capability statements, so be sure to ask Gloria about that. So, slide one, who are you? 
basic company information, company name, location, number of employees, some of the key set-asides if you have contract vehicles. You're going to cherry pick some of the basic identification information, size, revenue, things that give somebody a sense of what's this company do, where are they, how big are they. Okay. Now, slide two, core capabilities. You'll notice one, two, three, four. I'm going to challenge you to really knock it back to four. What are the things that, as far as the person you're in front of is concerned, your company does? Next slide. The opportunity. What's the specific thing that has brought you together? It may be a named project. For example, if you're doing a meeting that relates to the Department of Homeland Security, you can list the Advanced Acquisition Project number, the AAP number, and the name of the project right off the forecast. Both the Primes and the Department of Homeland Security really like that level of precision. In other instances, there might be a known problem that has just gotten reported in the Government Accountability Office report, and so it's a known problem and there might not be an RFP out on the street for it. But you want to talk about the specific agency, the need, the project. Fourth slide. What makes you special? Your unique value proposition. So there may be lots of companies with your core capabilities, but what are the things that set you apart? Your unique value proposition is a concise statement in the user's language that touches on how it is you solve their problem in a way that only you can do. Slide five, past performance. The critical thing here is a little like the core capabilities box above, three or four bullets, and you want to include not just the name of the project, but a couple of pieces of data like how big was the project, what was your share, your dollar revenue share of it, and what's the contact information for the point, prime point of contact you have on that project? Now, even if on the slide all you list is just the name of the project and its value, that can be enough to put on the slide. On your tailored capability statement that you're going to have as backup material for this, that may be the right place to put the contact information. All right. But past performance, three or four examples, the project, the name of it, how much it was worth at a minimum. And finally, the meeting objective. What do you want to accomplish? Some good examples of meeting objectives are you might want an introduction to the program manager within the prime contractor organization. Another thing that you could do, though, if this is a first meeting, you could also be asking the small business liaison officer for some feedback or commentary on how to strengthen your capability statement. Other things you could be asking for are what other opportunities might the small business liaison officer suggest that you be looking into that may be similar to the one that you've already presented. And they may be more interested in helping you when you show that you've done this exquisitely detailed level of homework on the particular thing that brought you together. So that's an idea of six simple slides that can then leave you time to build that relationship and get to know people. When you're closing your meeting, you don't just shake hands and drift off. I encourage you to stay focused on what brought you here so that all the time that you invested in preparing for the meeting, which is considerably more than your 15 or 30 minutes in front of somebody, will pay off with the time that you're spending doing your follow-up. And so, did you meet the people that you expected? Were these the right people in front of you? What referrals are you looking for to meet someone else? What questions do you still have? What questions did you agree to answer for the people you met with? When and how are you going to follow up? This is really important and is often lost on people. There's about four simple questions that you can ask that will narrow down and suddenly get somebody willing to put some time on their calendar. For example, you think about the time of year that you're in. When's a good time? You're trying to say at the end of the meeting, when would be a good time for us to follow up? Say, 
before or before or after Memorial Day. All right, and maybe then is that the the third week of June might be good for you. Is earlier or later in the week better for you? Are mornings or afternoons better? And suddenly you've got out a calendar and you've eased them into being willing maybe to put something down on their calendar. Be sure to ask whether they prefer phone or email or they'd like to meet with you in person again. Some people give great phone and absolutely hate email. Other people never pick up the phone, but they just love the convenience of email. So find out what works for the particular person you want to follow up with so you're reaching them in a way that works well for them. Find out whether or not anybody needed more information from you about your company. Not everybody will come with a business card. Make sure that you brought lots and make sure you remember to ask. Some, in more than a few meetings, I know I've just gotten so excited about being in the meeting that I've walked out without any business cards. So don't let this happen to you. In short, you really want to find that sweet spot between apathy and pestilence. Somewhere between waiting for them to call you and nothing happening and calling them every third day of the week, say, oh, do you got anything, got anything, got anything? There's, you're, you'll get a sense of when is a good interval, how often should we keep in touch. And you really want to know that and get a sense of what kind of value you can bring to them over time. What kinds of things do they like? How can you be helpful to them? There's four big types of teaming. Here they are. Relationship between a prime contractor and a subcontractor, a prime sub-relationship. That's the most common. Second, joint venture. Two companies have a limited time and scope agreement to pursue a very specific thing or collection of things. Third, mentor-protege agreements. And, third, and for, finally, the General Services Administration, or GSA, contractor teaming arrangement. There are other things like licensing and distribution and cooperative R&D, but I'm going to spend a little time talking about each of these four. We're going to be talking about affiliations and joint ventures, which is what I call the art of dirty dancing without losing your shirt. Remember that these large prime contractors have supplier diversity portals. So if you're going to be setting up a meeting with one of these primes, remember to look at their website and do your homework beforehand. In every case, the large primes have a section of their website for vendors or suppliers or supplier diversity or doing business with XYZ company. Look there, look at the rules of engagement, but invariably you will find a place where you can register your company to do business with that, comp with that large prime. Fill that out first as part of your basic research before your first meeting. That adds to your credibility. It makes it easier for the person that you're meeting with or the people you're meeting with to find you and pass along the link or the information internally within the company. But remember to be selective. These profiles take a bunch of time to fill out. They're very detailed, and none of them is identical to the others. One of the ways that I suggest that people make that easier is to have, say, an Excel spreadsheet or, or, or a read-only Word document that has is really the repository for the detailed information that typically these supplier diversity profiles want, whether that's your DUNS number, your keywords, your commercial and government entity or CAGE code. You want to have all of that in one place so it's, you're using consistent data in not only all of these supplier diversity portals, but also it should match the data that's in your central contractor registry profile. Another tip. Consider at the time of year when you've got to go and renew your CCR, consider that the time to go and update all of your profiles in all of the primes and use that consistent information. Update your, your information repository first, and that will make cutting and pasting and updating a lot easier. But with the supplier portal registrations, remember to be selective because you know what's going to happen if you go and fill out two dozen of these supplier portal registrations. Pretty much the same thing as when you registered on CCR. Dollars to donuts, pretty much absolutely nothing. Somebody may look for you, somebody may call you, but don't count on it. So it's what I call a necessary but not sufficient condition to win. Enough said. So there's a critical issue that you need to be aware of when you're exploring teaming. 
That's the concept of affiliation. The Small Business Administration's rules and the federal acquisition regulations both address these. And the co key concept with affiliation is this. Does one company have direct or indirect control over another one? Is the control actual or is it just potential, even if the control is potential? One company doesn't control the other but could. Or are both companies controlled by a third party? All of those sorts of things could trigger a definition that the two companies are affiliated. If one company has majority ownership in another one, or if one is a subsidiary of the other, those companies could be considered affiliated. If there's a lot of the same management of each of the companies, those companies could be considered affiliated. If one company and the other both share the same office space or facilities or capital equipment, or if one makes the capital equipment or the facilities available at no charge to the other, that company, one company is very reliant on the other, those companies could be considered affiliated. If one company has a, relies on the other for a lot of their revenue or contracts, those companies could be considered affiliated. Now, in and of itself, that doesn't matter. But if you are considering teaming with a company that you have a relationship that's so close in some of those ways I just described that you could cons be considered to be affiliated, then pay attention to whether or not there is a size standard attached to the small business classification that might apply to the contract you want to win. Here's why. You look at small business in procurement from two perspectives. One is whether, is whether or not your business qualifies as small by the North American Industrial Classification of the item that's being procured or of the product or service that you're providing. You can decide what NAICS codes apply to your company, but the contracting officer decides what NAICS code is going to apply to a given procurement. And so the NAICS code that the contracting officer sets corresponds with the maximum size, if it's a set-aside for small business, that the company that's the prime contractor can be. If the contracting officer chooses to set aside the contract for small business, then the NAICS code the contracting officer chooses carries with it a maximum size by of revenue, if it's a services contract, or a number of employees, if it's for a manufactured good, that the prime contractor can be. Now, if you are bidding on that project as a small business with a partner that you are affiliated with, the Small Business Administration counts the level of revenue or the number of employees of all the affiliated companies, both partners, when they're trying to determine whether or not that prime contractor qualifies as small and can legitimately win the project. Now, that's a very big concept, and I'm only covering it once. I've got two regulations that are written down at the bottom of the slide, Federal Acquisition Regulation, subpart 19.1, and the Small Business Administration Regulations, 13, Title 13, Code of Federal Regulations, part 121.103. Read them, become familiar with them. They're going to be really important to stay clear of difficulties because if you turn out to be affiliated with a company and as a result are determined to be too big for the set-aside you're supposed to be qualified to win, you can lose the contract, you can be disbarred, it can make it, let's say, a very unpleasant teaming experience that you won't want to go back to. Here's some other key concepts in teaming. As I said before, teaming is typically project-specific. Metaprotege programs and the use of them throughout federal agencies is expanding. Both ones that are contingent, which is to say, in one agency, you'll say, I'm going to be part of a mentor-protege program if I win. And the other is non-contingent mentor-protege programs. For example, the Department of Homeland Security typically tells its primes, as part of the condition of competing for this contract, you must already be participating in our mentor-protege program. That's non-contingent. You've got to be in the program whether you win or not. 
8 a programs and mentor protege programs are under a lot of scrutiny through the Congress right now, so you have just one more reason, not that you needed one, to make sure that you're playing the game by the rules and keeping squeaky clean and in all of your practices. I've got a terrific link that's here on this slide to have affiliation rules that are discussed in really great and comprehensive ways through the Office of the Secretary of Defense, Office of Small Business Programs. I will read the URL, which I don't usually do because it's such a great resource. So www.a, C like Charlie, Q like Quebec, dot OSD, for Office of the Secretary of Defense, dot mil, slash OSBP, slash resources, slash teaming, dot PDF. If it weren't that special, I wouldn't be reading it to you. What could possibly go wrong in a teaming arrangement? Well, I asked this question to a class that I was teaching last week, and we came up with a pretty long list. And so I challenge you to sit and think about what are all the interests that you would want to protect and make sure that you've got rules of engagement that define the relationship between yourself and the partner you're doing business with. Just some of those could include who's paying for the cost of the proposal. If we are on the bid and you win, do we get to perform on the contract? How are we pricing our share of it? When are we getting paid? As a partner, do I agree to be an exclusive partner just with you, the prime, or can I bid with lots of primes? Do we have a confidentiality or non-disclosure agreement in place as part of this agreement? What happens if we want to end it all? How are we sharing expenses for operations? Which clauses flow down from the Federal Acquisition Regulation prime contract down to the sub? Here's a, one people a lot, a lot of time don't think about. If you're the subcontractor, does the prime contractor let you set foot in the agency? Do you have any contact with the end users? Read the fine print. You might be looking for past performance and building relationships, and if you don't read that contract carefully, you could be signing something that means you don't get to meet a single soul. All you get to talk to is your one liaison person in the big prime's office. That might not be what you want. Think about protecting your intellectual property. Make sure that your talented employees, there's a clause saying that they can't poach your employees from you. That's just a short list of things to think about. With teaming agreements, though, more than anything, we all believe, most of us believe, in preventative dentistry. Most of us have our, our uh, arms twisted to believe in preventative medicine. Why it is that more of us do not believe in preventative legal services is beyond me. I don't enjoy shelling out thousands of dollars for legal assistance reviewing agreements, but I do it when I want to protect my company, and in my case, because I'm a consultant, my intellectual property. Teaming agreements and making sure you've got a good, solid legal review protect you and they protect your company, and especially if you're doing a teaming arrangement with somebody you care about, a friend, a longtime colleague, you really care about that relationship, so you want to make sure that you know what the rules are so you're all protected, you know what's going to happen. So expect a cost as a cost of doing business to find a lawyer that has experience with federal contract teaming agreements to review an agreement you get handed. Just because the big prime hands you an agreement does not mean you have to sign it. If there are things in that agreement that, that you can negotiate, you'll want to. If there are things in that agreement that you can't afford or you don't want to do, be prepared to walk away because just signing something can hurt your company and can take you under. I bring to your attention a great resource, the National Contract Management Association www.ncmahq.org is a national chapter-based organization that I suggest you take a look at, check out some of their meetings. They often have things non-members can attend, and they have great resources online. So some suggestions for avoiding the top teaming traps that can really mess you up when you're looking for teaming business. First, be selective. You're not going to run after every single prime contractor in your niche. Because you're going to be project focused, you're going to be looking for your highest potential projects for the primes that, if they're doing a good job, are incumbents or have the best chance of unseating the incumbents. And a long time before the opportunity comes up for formal competition, you're going to be building relationships with them and finding 
the ones that have the best fit with you. They're going to care about you because you've done your homework. You've researched the company. Two stories I'll tell you. There's, I mean, you don't want to be in the meeting with somebody from Raytheon who's asking you, I want to do business with Raytheon. And they say, what part? And you think fast and you go, ah, uh, the Ray part. Or, and this is a real story, my friend John Long, who was vice president of business development for the civil systems division at Northrop Grumman, told this charming story of small businesses sitting in his office, winding up the big pitch of what it is they bring to the table on this big project, and the small business finally says, and we're going to help you unseat the incumbent. Wait for it. John sits back, and he looks at the guy, and he says, you know we are the incumbent. <gasps> Don't let this happen to you. Do your homework. And pay attention before you go into the teaming meeting of what was in the news just that morning that could be affecting your prime. I'll be real. I'm going to share a story that I don't normally share. I was actually um, being considered to be doing a project for one of these large primes, and it, we'd been going on meetings for months and months and months, and I was all set for my meeting that was probably going to close the deal. And the fellow I was meeting with was really distracted, and I thought, uh-oh. And he says, well, of course you heard the news today, and I'm thinking scramble, 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 and I'm nodding sagely and thinking, I am so much trouble. I've got so much trouble because I have no idea what he's talking about. The, this prime had lost a major project that meant they had to completely reconfigure their business development operation, and there's no way they had any money to do the project I was going to do with them. I was completely out of luck, and I was totally clueless. So I mean, even when you want to walk your talk, stuff happens. So I learned do your homework before you meet with these people. Be right up to the minute. Check the web even just on the day of the meeting a couple of hours before. Next, especially with respect to affiliation, read those rules first and then seek the guidance from the Small Business Administration. If you are proposing a joint venture or a teaming agree agreement and you're a small business and you're going to be seeking to be a prime and working with larger companies or other small businesses, First read the rules, then go and talk to the Small Business Administration Regional Office Legal Counsel and say, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Am I going to run into any trouble? What should I be looking at? What rules should I be paying attention to? Here's what I found. What am I missing? And the third step of that is that once you've talked to the SBA and you're ready to do the teaming agreement, if you've done your homework, read the rules, and consulted SBA, this is going to be not only a lot more comfortable, you'll be speaking the language, but when you go and see your lawyer, you're going to save money because your lawyer is not going to spend all of her time explaining this to you from the word go at $175 or $275 an hour. So really there's a big motivation to read the rules. You save money and you're smart. Fourth, use a teaming agreement. Tip, you're not going to going to, going to surf the web and find a teaming agreement that's going to be pretty much a template and you can just change I dare you. Go out to the web, go search on teaming agreement or federal teaming agreement. You'll find all kinds of things there. You will find an agreement for a small business innovation and research project with the Department of Energy and the Tennessee Valley Authority. You will find a project for creating new plant life forms and documenting how they come out with the Department of Agriculture. You will find a teaming agreement for sharing databases. You're not going to find a teaming agreement that is going to be specific to the agency and the project you want to do business with, the kind of products and services that are involved, and your specific company's concerns. So boilerplate is death. Come with a shopping list of the things that are important to you. You may have some other models that have worked well, but be prepared to create something that is unique. Once you've got a core that works well for your company, that you can be using your own internal boilerplate, but you really have to tailor it every time for every project and get legal assistance. This is not a do-it-yourself project. And finally, bring the business. That's the thing that makes a huge difference on whether or not a prime is ever going to return your call. So this is what we covered. The one thing primes really want, show me the money. Three ways to rock 
your capability briefing, which are those six slides in 600 seconds, setting your goals and objectives for the meeting, and doing your homework. And we've just gone through the top teaming traps. So what's next? What are the success secrets and the action steps you can take today? Well, in working with over 6,000 clients in nearly 25 years of doing this, I found that there are seven steps that successful companies all take on the road to success. Strategy. Is this good business for your business? Focus. Focus or go broke. There's too much opportunity that you can simply not begin to get any traction on if you don't focus your efforts on one or two projects and really focus on building the relationships. Process. How does the federal government and prime buy the products and services that you offer in that agency? Competition. Your competitors have laid an electronic trail that points you right to your next best opportunities if you know how to read the signs. That's part of what I help my clients do. Teaming is what we talked about today. And, of course, people do business with people they know and people do business with people they like. So the relationships that you want to pursue are not the ones that you get through brute force networking through every association and meeting and breakfast and lunch and dinner in town. You only have so many hours in the day and you've got to eat and you've got to sleep. So you want to really focus your relationship development on things, places, events where you can connect with the people who can move your opportunities along. And the choices you make in those six steps govern how you're going to spend the scarce marketing resources you have because all of us have scarce marketing resources, whether we're Northrop or we're two guys in a garage. And that's the time for questions. So I want to open it up, and I hope that's been a helpful once-over. Absolutely. It has been fabulous. Thank you so much for your expertise, Judy. It is a wealth of knowledge that you've brought to today's session about teaming essentials, what primes really want. And what we'd like to do is open this up for questions right now. I believe Steve Lamberson from the Fort Detrick Business Development Office has some that he'd like to share with us. Yeah, got a couple that have come in. And uh, are you ready, Judy? Yep, hit me. All right. All right, first question I have is, uh, what are some top things I should research before I meet with a prime? Great question, Steve. Here's some basics. First, and you can start online to answer some of these questions. Understand what are the rules they have for doing business with partners. For example, some kinds of primes want their partners to come in with certain kinds of uh, quality standards. For example, if you want to do business with Boeing, you might have to meet certain, say, ISO standards, or there may be with software. Some, some other companies may have to meet a CMMI level or something like that. There may be other things they want all their partners to know and conditions they want you to fulfill. Second, look at and participate in and fill out your profile on their supplier diversity portal. We talked about that. They're everywhere. You go to their site and you look up supplier diversity or supplier or vendor or doing business with, you'll find it. Third, think hard about where your capability, your interests, and your past performance fit with their divisions or organizations. I was in a conference once where somebody was offering gift baskets and they wanted to do business with Boeing. Now, don't snicker. Boeing buys hundreds of gift baskets, but the Integrated Defense Systems Division is not the part of Boeing that buys it. That's part of Boeing corporate. So know where you fit in which divisions of their organization. Research the specific current contracts they hold that are in your domain or your technical expertise area. And on, you can do this on usaspending.gov. Find the expiry dates. When do those contracts expire? And then work backwards with lots of lead time. And then look up some non-incumbent opportunities that you could help them win through trade press, associations, the local business journal, Washington Business Journal in this region, see what other things they might be interested in winning that you could help them win. So to recap, their rules of doing business with partners, participation in their supplier diversity portal, 
where you fit in the organization, contracts they, they are current on, and non-incumbent opportunities you could help them win. All right. Uh, um, question number two I have. Why do small business size standards matter when you're teaming with a large company? Recap, it's because you as a small business might take the role of prime contractor, whether you're teaming with a large company or a small one. And if that contract you want to win is set aside for your kind of small business, then to win and keep your contract, if you're teamed with any other company, that relationship with your partner must be free of affiliation or conducted under the relaxed affiliation rules so that you remain compliant with the side standard and can keep the contract. Okay. All right. And, uh, Gloria, I have one more question, if that's okay. That'll be great, Steve. All right. Uh, one more question, Judy. Uh, uh, what certifications are important when I am seeking business with Prime? What a great question. There's two different layers to this. When you're talking about contracts with the federal government, most people think about the four major set-aside programs, woman-owned or economically disadvantaged-owned women-owned small business, or the 8M program, the 8A program, service-disabled veteran-owned small business, and historically underutilized business zone or hub zone, the four major programs. But here's something you might not expect. The large prime supplier diversity programs often require their small business partners to have other certifications that are recognized by the private sector. Those four major SBA certifications are recognized by the federal government. But large primes may also want their small suppliers who say, oh, I'm a minority-owned firm or I'm a woman-owned firm, to also show that they have certification from a national organization like, for minority-owned firms, the National Minority Suppliers Development Council or one of their, their uh, regional or state affiliates or organizations. Or if you're a woman-owned business, large primes may also want or require you to show that you're a certified women's business enterprise certified by either the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, WBENC, we think, or the National Women's Business Council, NWBC. And so look those up. There's also an, another, another certification. The National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce is also, may also represent a different kind of certification that is coming up on the radar as well, NGLCC, NGLCC.org, another one to look up. So remember to look up the private sector certifications and see which ones are important for your business to hook up, as well as understanding which of the SBA certifications you're eligible for. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Judy. That was excellent questions and answers. And if you are listening to this session as a recording, remember you can send your questions in at any time to ask at fdbdo.com. Judy, thank you so much for your level of expertise that you've brought to us today. It has been very, very helpful. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to hearing questions from the Fort Dietrich Business Development Office clientele. And, Steve, thank you so much for the invitation to join you today. Yeah, yeah, uh, great job, Judy. Really appreciate it. Fantastic mm -hmm. content. Speaking of Steve, tell us what's going on at the FDBDO. All right. Well, first, uh, a little bit about the FDBDO, Fort Dietrich Business Development Office. We are a free service available to companies who are interested in competing for business on federal contracts. Uh, it's specifically for those contracts that are in support of Fort Dietrich. Now, our office does many things. I'll only mention a couple since we're running short of time. Uh, we provide education and training for companies of all levels, federal experience, such as this webinar on teaming with primes. Uh, in addition to training, the FDBDO provides market information on the solicitations that are released on those uh, solicitations in support of Fort Dietrich. Uh, timing is important when addressing a solicitation, so what our office does is we match up those opportunities with the businesses that are registered with our office. So it's very important that you get registered with us and you can register your company at our website 
It's www.fdbdo.com. Or you can call us at 301-620-7071. And also um, want to mention the upcoming uh, webinar we have on April 12th is uh, it's for technology transfer. It's the basics in technology transfer. So if you're a, a company or a startup company with a new idea or a product in development stage looking for grants from state or federal, uh, state and federal funding uh, to help get your product up and running, you know, this is a good uh, a, a class for you. And all of our classes are, are, are posted to our website at our learning library link including this, uh, this webinar that Judy has just provided for us. And it, it, you can find that at our website, fdbdo.com. Uh, you can register for, you can find our other webinars that are located under a calendar of events also that are upcoming on, uh, down, uh, down the road. So thanks again, Judy, and um, appreciate it, Gloria. Thank you. Absolutely. It's time for us to call it a day, so I want to remind you to sign up for the FDBDO newsletters. They come out regularly with very interesting information about being more successful in the federal government contracting market. So check out the FDBDO.com website for other live and recorded webinars and in-person instructor-led workshops dealing with specific issues relating to government contracting business development. This is your host, Gloria Larkin with TargetGov, wishing you great success in the federal contracting market. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.